Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back and buckle up for the second installment of our three-part briefing mini-series about the transportation sector and climate change. Today, we take to the skies and discuss, after COVID, a lower carbon future for commercial aviation. I'm Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. EESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change policies to policymakers. We have also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. We hold many briefings, lately all online, but that is only one way we reach and educate congressional staff and other stakeholders. We also do a lot of writing articles, fact sheets, and reports. Of course, everything we produce is available online at www.eesi.org. And if you're interested in an environmental, energy, and climate change topic, I think the odds are pretty good that EESI has covered it at some point. I mentioned the writing part of our work because about a year, to, a year ago, we released one of our best, a stratospherically popular fact sheet, the growth in greenhouse gas emissions from commercial aviation. The author, Jeff Overton, a fellow with the ESI and my co-moderator for, for today. I encourage everyone to check it out. It's a great fact sheet, chock full of information. Commercial aviation and, its contribution, and the contribution of air travel to greenhouse gas emissions is a critical topic. It is such a feature of the modern world, at least when travel is allowed, and its future is captivating. New fuels, new propulsion technologies, and new sources of efficiency on the ground and from air traffic control. I will leave the rest of the discussion to our panel. And our panel is really tremendous. And I'm also very pleased that we have a first class guest joining us today, Representative Julia Brownlee, who represents California's 26th Congressional District in the House of Representatives. In addition to Representative Brownlee's commitment to ensuring access to mental and physical health care for US service members, veterans, and their families, she is also a climate change leader. Representative Brownlee is a member of the subcommittees on aviation and Highways and Transit of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, as well as the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. The Select Committee, you will likely recall, issued a comprehensive set of climate change policy findings and recommendations back in June. ESI also hosted a special briefing on that report, and that is, of course, available for viewing on our website, www.esi.org. Good afternoon. I'm Congresswoman Julia Brownlee, representing the 26th Congressional District in Ventura County, California. I want to thank EESI, including Daniel Brissett and Anna McGinn, for inviting me to provide remarks for today's briefing on a lower carbon future for commercial aviation. As a member of the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, and the House Transportation and Infrastructure Subcommittee on Aviation, I believe that Congress must do more to help decarbonize the transportation sector, including the aviation industry. As you may know, aviation-related emissions currently account for 2.6% of total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions and 9% of emissions by the U.S. transportation sector. While decarbonization of surface transportation modes is focused heavily on electrification and fuel cell technology, the development of such technology in the aviation industry is just beginning. So in the near term, the aviation sector will continue to be reliant on liquid fuels. Fortunately, there is a proven technology on the market today that can significantly reduce aviation emissions, sustainable aviation fuel. Sustainable aviation fuel, or SAF, is a fuel that can be blended with traditional jet fuel and be used in existing aircraft engines. SAF is already certified by regulators to meet aviation safety requirements. In fact, since 2011, more than 200,000 flights have used sustainable aviation fuel. So we know it works. And we know that SAF can reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50% compared to fossil jet fuel. 
Unfortunately, commercial scale production of SAF is only beginning. In my view, the SAF market needs a significant jumpstart from policymakers if commercial production is going to ramp up fast enough to meet the ambitious climate change goals set forth in the Select Committee's recently released Blueprint for Climate Action. That is why this week I was proud to introduce the Sustainable Aviation Fuel Act which is a bill intended to tackle challenges in the marketplace and boost SAF production from multiple angles. My bill includes a tax credit for the production of SAF that increases based upon the emissions reduction it achieves, thereby incentivizing the most sustainable fuels. The bill would authorize a billion dollars over five years in competitive grants and cost-sharing agreements for the production, transportation, blending, or storage of SAF. My bill also authorizes additional research dollars to further help the aviation industry decarbonize and strive towards a zero emission goal. Finally, the bill would elevate California's low carbon fuel standard to the national level for the aviation sector. California's success with its low carbon fuel standard shows that implementing a national standard could be a major step in achieving deep long-term reductions in greenhouse gas emissions from fuels. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to provide remarks today and to let you know about my new SAF bill. If you're interested in more details or want to share feedback, please reach out to me or my legislative assistant, David Scott. Thank you again to EESI for organizing today's briefing. Great, well, thank you so much for joining us today, Representative Brownlee, um, and congratulations on your bill introduction, and thanks to you and your staff for your leadership on climate change issues in Congress, and um, I'll, uh, echo what you said, special thanks to David on your staff for his assistance as we plan, uh, planned today's briefing. So thank you all. Before I introduce our other panelists, I have two announcements to help make our trip a little more comfortable. First, this is the second of a three-part mini-series this week, second installment of a three-part mini-series this week. Yesterday, we heard from three practitioners from Washington State and Maryland about efforts to improve resilience at port facilities. And tomorrow, at this same time, we will have a roundtable discussion with representatives from three leading transportation authorities about public transit. I hope you'll be able to join us for the entire mini-series and join our club of frequent viewers. And number two, let me explain how you can ask questions. We are not in person today, so if you have a question, you have two options to ask it. You can send us a message on Twitter, you can follow us at EESI online, or you can send an email to EESI at EESI.org. We will do our best to get to everyone's questions during our question and answer period after our second briefing, second panelist, excuse me. And now on to our panelists, and it is my uh, privilege to introduce them. Uh, first, we will hear from Chris Tyndall. Chris is the Assistant Director for the Commercial Aviation Alternative Fuels Initiative, or CAFI. And the goal of CAFI is to promote the development and commercialization of alternative jet fuel options that offer equivalent levels of safety and compare favorably on cost with petroleum-based jet fuel, while also offering environmental improvement and security of energy supply for aviation. He helps manage the coalition of CAFI stakeholders and provide leadership and strategic guidance uh, to its state and regional programs, the federal government and uh, federal government's interagency initiatives, airport authorities, international initiatives consistent with CAFI principles. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today for this really cool briefing. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Dan. Uh, I really uh, feel, am very honored to be on this panel with uh, with Barbara Esker, and I really do appreciate everything that EESI uh, has been doing. And of course, uh, Representative Brownlee um, was was really is is instrumental in actually introducing this uh, SAF Act. Uh, and she mentioned, uh, you know, David Scott. Uh, we were actually working with him in in helping with, um, you know, the the whole verbiage, I guess you could say, of the, uh, of the bill. Uh, he just basically was asking us some, some uh, very important questions uh, within the CAFI uh, perspective. 
uh, so across the board. Well, what I'd like to do now is I'll uh, go ahead and jump into my uh, into my presentation, if that's okay. And um, and I will. Um, I am very again very very honored to be uh, to be a part of this, and uh, I, I really do appreciate uh, being able to share with you a lot of things about uh, the sustainable aviation fuel and the the overall market. Um, so I wanted to share this uh, this this picture with you. Uh, it's from March of 2016, and this was the, our first uh, first flight of continuous commercial production of SAF in actual use. Uh, so United Airlines um, actually went into a uh, a contract, an offtake contract with World Energy, and they're the ones who are supplying it on a continual basis to the United Airlines, and this goes to uh, Los Angeles Airport. So I want to tell you that if you have since 2016 flown through um, LAX, uh, you've been flying on sustainable aviation fuels because the storage tanks there are, um, are, are just for all the airlines. And even though United Airlines is the one who actually purchased it, it goes into the, uh, the hydrant system and the tanks. And so every airline that's using that is actually, uh, is actually gonna be using that, that fuel. So let me tell you briefly a little bit about CAFI. We are a, a public-private partnership, and we are um, actually sponsored by uh, FAA and the Aerospace Industries Association, the Airports Council International for North America, and also Airlines for America. And so we're basically out there to to try to um, uh, try to get the the promotion of um, of the sustainable aviation fuel at a at a commercial scale. And so we're out there promoting it and we're working across the whole supply value chain from feedstocks all the way to the end users as well too. So this is a, a very important uh, slide to, uh, to, to look at uh, with, this, with this chart. We have three basic goals that were um, sort of underneath the, the carbon offsetting reduction scheme for international aviation that the uh, International Civil Aviation uh, organization has put out. Uh, the first goal was mainly to be more efficient, um, and that that goal was a 1.5% efficiency. Uh, and so you can see how those annual efficiencies have actually been able to uh, to lower the line on our uh, our carbon emissions. The second goal is to be uh, carbon neutral growth uh, in 2020, um, and then in the third goal is uh, to be 50% less carbon emissions in 2050 compared to a baseline of 2005. Now, what I want to uh, point out to you in the light blue area on the lower right side of the screen is basically where that those reductions are mainly going to be coming from radical new technologies and sustainable aviation fuel. So um, Barbara is going to be talking a lot about some of these radical new technologies, and then I'm going to be talking about the uh, the sustainable uh, aviation alternative fuels as well too. So just very briefly uh, telling you a little, a little bit about what uh, SAF uh, really is. It's, uh, it comes in a lot of different, uh, a lot of different terminologies. You've got aviation biofuel, biojet, alternative aviation fuel. Uh, but basically the aviation fuel is the jet fuel that, that meets the ASTM, the American Society of Testing and Materials, uh, standards. Uh, this one, D1655, that's for aviation turbine fuel. Uh, and then when we talk about the sustainability, it addresses the greenhouse gas reductions across the board. And how we get there, uh, the synthetic hydrocarbons, the synthetic jet fuel is basically coming from many different uh, biochemical and thermochemical processes. And I like to say that sustainable aviation fuel is just like traditional jet fuel instead of coming from dead dinosaurs, it's coming from things like uh, waste oils, feed, uh, uh, waste oils and fats and greases and beef tallow and, and things like that, even purpose-grown oilseed crops, and in some cases, municipal solid waste. So that's very, uh, that obviously can be very, very sustainable across the board. So from a technical aspect, um, we do have seven different approved uh, pathways uh, right now from through ASTM, 
We have about six of those pathways that are in process at different stages from tier one to tier four. Um, and then we have others uh, outside of the pipeline that will be getting into the pipeline soon, you know, more than 15 different ones. So as we continue to open the aperture to more and more types of pathways, that's a, that's a very, very big, uh, big aspect that we want to, we want to push forward. So the, the, the major sustainable feedstocks that are out there, uh, obviously we have the oil lipids that, that I was mentioning, you know, the fat soils and greases, you've got sugars, you even have the municipal solid waste that I was mentioning to you. And uh, these conversion processes are both thermochemical and biochemical across the board. But the important thing to remember too, that sustainable aviation fuel is a drop-in uh, drop replacement fuel. Um, it can be mixed in with regular traditional uh, jet fuel. Uh, it is not an additive. Um, in these particular pathways, uh, they've been approved up to a 50-50 blend. So we can do 50% fossil and then 50% of the sustainable aviation fuel in the majority of those, uh, of those pathways across the board. Um, so we are, we are continuing to to streamline the overall qualification for the time and the money that it takes as well as the methods. So hopefully we'll be able to get more and more of these pathways into, uh, into process. So where we stand right now, um, you know, we've been doing this since around 2006 or seven. Um, and so it's not been that long that we've been actually uh, been on this road. Um, and so a lot of government has been doing, doing some things uh, and then, um, as I mentioned to you, in March of 2016 is when, when the commercial airlines started to use it. And business aviation is also, general aviation is also very much engaged uh, across the board. So the majority, we have uh, two facilities that are in operation. One is out in, uh, in California, the one that World Energy that I was mentioning to you. And then we have um, two facilities that are under construction, one out of Reno, Nevada, and one up in, um, up in Oregon. And so those will be using um, the uh, municipal solid waste for a feedstock and also wood waste for a feedstock and turning that into, uh, into jet fuel. Um, so the, the important thing to, to remember though is even though we have a very small amount of production, we have a lot of demand. Um, so we have over $6.5 billion in airline offtake commitments for over 350 million gallons per year uh, with more in, in development across the board. So what I'm going to do is, is tell you a little bit about that capacity forecast that we have that, that's out there. So you can see uh, where, where things are and where they're going to be. Uh, here in 2020, we, we assume that we're going to have around 59 million. And these, these are all pre-COVID numbers. But the important aspect is, even though we do have uh, this, this pandemic, um, we have not uh, had any any reduction in in the amount of work that that CAFE has been doing in trying to get these uh, these fuels to market, um, and we have across and that is across the the supply value chain too, all the way from the feedstocks to the end users. We still have people out there still wanting that across the board, so that's a good thing. So uh, by 2025, you can see we'll have over a billion gallons per year of, of production, because each of these years are cumulative, uh, as you can see all the different things that are, that are actually happening. So with that 1 billion gallons though, uh, is only about 1%, a little bit less than 1% than of the total global uh, production that, that's out there. Um, we, we, we use about 96 billion gallons per year. Again, this is a pre-COVID number, uh, 96 billion gallons per year in sustainable, I'm sorry, in traditional jet fuel. So one billion is, uh, is a little bit, uh, a little, right around 1%. So let me take, take you through very quickly through some of these offtake agreements that are out there. Uh, World Energy, as I mentioned to you, is one of the major ones that, that's out there producing it. And you can see all the different partners from United Airlines and then on general aviation with Gulfstream, et cetera. And I want to point out too that this is not just domestic in the United States, but this is a worldwide effort. So you have um, some uh, some uptake agreements with Air France and Finnair and SAS and Lufthansa. So you have a lot of those. 
Now, I'm just going to, without actually reading to you on all of these, I just wanted to, to show you that we have a number of different pages where we are showing all of these different types of offtake agreements that we have out there. Um, Neste is another uh, major producer. Uh, Porvu in, uh, in Finland is the one where they right now have a 34 million gallon per year capacity, but they're increasing that uh, both in their Rotterdam and then also in their Singapore plant. And you can see um, down there at the bottom that they'll, they, they uh, will have about 480 million gallons per year of production by 2023 is what's on the forecast right now. Um, and then here's some more with uh, with Givo. Um, Givo is, uh, is is using an alcohol to jet pathway, where they're actually using some uh, some ethanol uh, for for approaches to getting to the sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, Fulcrum Bioenergy is one of those plants. This is a plant that's using the the municipal solid waste uh, out there, um, right outside of Reno, Nevada, and so they'll be producing. Uh, right around 11 million gallons per year. Uh, but then they also plan on, on opening up other facilities uh, in the Chicago land area and Houston, Texas and, uh, and other places. So they have about five different uh, areas lined out right now. And they're also looking at overseas and doing developments in, uh, in Australia and, uh, and other places as well too. So that's very, very encouraging. Uh, Red Rock, the one there at the top, that's the one that's at Oregon, and they're using the wood waste, and they they uh, plan on having about the same, about 11 million gallons per year of production. Um, and then down at the very bottom, Lanza, Lanza Tech and Lanza Jet, uh, they're out there, and they're, they're planning to have 100 million gallons uh, per year of production by 2024 from four different facilities. Again, just wanted to highlight the fact that there is a lot of international um, uh, aspects to this with Qantas and KLM and ANA and, and others across the board. Um, so here we're already at page six and we're continuing to go with these offtake agreements. But we also have other airline commitments of greater ambition uh, from FedEx and Qantas and Finnair. And a lot of these are using uh, the commitments of having a net zero carbon by 2050. And that's what they're mainly uh, mainly pushing and looking for. There is some pressure to maybe get some, some more progress by 2035 uh, across the board as well too. By the way, um, in, case of, in case you're trying to take uh, all these, uh, these notes with all of the, 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 uh, the wording here, we will be offering these, uh, these slides um, after, the, after the presentation too. So more uh, commitments of, uh, of greater ambition. In this case, we're actually asking, or these, these airlines have, ask the passengers to help to offset the cost of the sustainable aviation fuel because admittedly they're a little bit more uh, than the traditional jet fuel right now. Supply and demand when you have a lot of demand but uh, very little supply then the, the prices are, are going to be a little bit higher. Plus we're, we're still going through a lot of research and development and trying to lower the cost across the board. So in this case though, um, you know, airlines like Lufthansa and SAS, they actually have an option to pay for an incremental price of the SAF uh, in in um, in different different aspects, so you can see where you know they're they're getting the flying public involved in that as well too. And for the most part, a lot of people are saying, "Yeah, I don't mind paying a little bit extra." You know, when you're paying uh, three or four hundred dollars for uh, for round trip, uh, uh, you know, is it okay to pay a little bit more, maybe twenty bucks more? You know, I certainly am going to do that myself. Um, and then we have uh, big, country, uh, big countries that are also um, getting involved in this, and they have some mandates out there that they are putting into place. Uh, Norway has a 0.5 blending mandate, mandate for, for these uh, advanced aviation biofuels for SAF uh, from 2020 on. Netherlands is transitioning their military air, aircraft uh, to be able to, uh, to, to use that as well, too. Um, the nice thing about it is, is we don't have to actually change out any, uh, any engine parts or anything. It's a drop-in replacement. So they're just transitioning the, the military to actually use the fuel. Um, and in France and Sweden, they also have these, uh, these reductions that are going on. And then the EU, uh, European Commission is also involved in, in setting some, uh, some roadmaps and some mandates 
across the board too. So um, I wanted to to highlight here that uh, we certainly do have a lot of uh, a lot of demand out there, a very significant uh, commercial pull across the board, and so the this uh, we do have uh, we are making a lot of progress, even though there is some some uh, challenges that are out there, and so the potential for acceleration is is a function of the engagement that we're doing, the offtake agreements that are out there. We want to have some good replication. Um, it's easier to build the second, third, and fourth biorefinery than it is the first. Uh, so in a lot of cases like Fulcrum and and uh, and Givo and Red Rock, you know, they're still trying to just do their first ones. But once they do have their first ones, then they'll be able to get more out there. Uh, but then it's also a a uh, part of the policy. And we'll, we'll get into that, I know, during the Q&A is talking a little bit about the policy aspects of that across the board too. So sustainable aviation fuel is uh, coming from a diverse set of, uh, of, of feedstocks from across the globe. Uh, we're all in this together. And you can see some of the, uh, the different uh, waste residues and even uh, some, uh, some other circular economy byproducts that are used. So when you can use waste products, uh, to actually produce some some fuel like municipal solid waste, that's uh, that's very very cool when you can have that kind of an aspect. So I thank you very much. I'm uh, looking forward to the Q and A, and of course looking forward to uh, to Barbara's presentation as well too. And here's my uh, my contact information. So Dan, thank you very much. Oh, thanks, Chris. That was a great presentation. And uh, yes, you uh, pointed out that your presentation materials will be available online. That is 100% true. Um, you can find those at www.esi.org. Not just the presentation materials from Chris and the next panelist as well, but also a written summary uh, of today's uh, briefing and um, an archive of the webcast. So if you would like to listen to it uh, or watch it, um, you're, you're welcome to do that. And um, while you're there, uh, you know, poke around, find other good climate change policy information, and uh, if you have a second, sign up for our newsletter, bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. It's a great way to stay informed. If you have any questions uh, for Chris or for our next panelist, uh, there are two ways you can get them to us. One is by following us on Twitter, at EESI Online. Alternatively, you can send us an email, EESI at EESI.org. Uh, and our second panelist, uh, Barbara Esker. Uh, Barbara is the Deputy Director for the Advanced Air Vehicles Program, formerly Fundamental Aeronautics Program, under the NASA Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters here in Washington, D.C. In collaboration with the program director, Barbara supports the overall planning, management, and evaluation of the directorate's efforts to develop tools, technologies, and concepts that enable new generations of civil aircraft that are safer, more energy efficient, and have a smaller environmental footprint. Barbara, welcome to the panel today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. All right. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate the uh, kind introduction. And let me get um, my charts up and we'll go from there. All right. Are you seeing, seeing the charts come up? Excellent. Thank you. So as Chris said, um, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be here and, and address you all. And uh, so thank you very much um, for that and for the kind introduction, Dan. Um, as, as Dan said, I'm um, the Deputy Director of the Advanced Air Vehicles uh, Program within the NASA Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate. Um, we certainly have our roots going back to, um, you know, 1915 to the, to the formation of, of the NAC or the NASA, the National uh, Advisory Council on Aeronautics. So I don't have to tell this audience how important aviation is, you know, to, to the global economy, to the U.S. national economy. Um, within, you know, of course, pre-COVID numbers, um, aviation represents about 1.6 trillion of U.S. economic activity each year. And included in that is about 11 million um, direct and indirect jobs, including a million of which, which are high quality manufacturing jobs. Um, aviation has carried 21 million tons of freight worldwide, and that's just by U.S. carriers, and um, about 889 million passengers by U.S. air carriers. So, so it's a very important element of um, our economic structure, and of course, um, the impact on the environment is a, is a foremost uh, importance. 
So at, at NASA Aeronautics, um, a few years ago, we took a step back and we looked at um, what were the major forces driving um, aviation um, for now and into the next um, few centuries, a <laughs> few decades. And, and we came up with the three, um, what we call mega drivers on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, these are global mobility. Um, the, the demand for global transportation will in fact increase and increase substantially over the next um, several decades. Uh, hand in hand with that are environmental challenges. Um, certainly, we need to be very cognizant of the impact on the environment today, but as that global air traffic continues to grow, um, what are those environmental challenges that we're going to face in the future? And then the third uh, mega driver is something that we call technology convergence. And, and this is the, the recognition that there's uh, segments of the, um, the technological landscape that move very quickly. And how are those um, segments going to affect aviation? So think of this in terms of things like uh, IT technology and, and machine learning and artificial intelligence and, and um, power and energy technologies as well. And those technologies will have impact on uh, aviation looking forward. Now, if you'd like additional information on what those analyses had resulted in uh, around these mega drivers, the um, strategic implementation plan website is shown at the top of this chart. Now, in response to those mega drivers, um, when we, again, when we took this step back, we identified six strategic thrusts. So consider these to be um, six um, strategic swim lanes that are intended to guide our research looking forward. And uh, you can read them on the chart. Um, the three that are very profoundly um, related to vehicle technologies and, and the work in my program area are thrusts two, three, and four, uh, innovation in commercial supersonics, ultra-efficient subsonic transports, and safe, quiet, affordable vertical lift air vehicles. Now for today's remarks, I'm going to focus uh, predominantly on the ultra-efficient subsonic transports. So um, before we get into some of the material, I'd like to, to take, take a quick moment to introduce some technology so that we um, can communicate effectively for the rest of the brief. Um, technology readiness level. I'll, you'll hear me reference technology readiness level through or TRL through the remarks. And, and it's shown here on the chart. And basically, it's a way to um, describe the maturity of a given technology. And this starts from you know, the ba very basic R&D when the um, initial principles are observed and reported all the way up through application in a, in a real system and in a real environment. Now, NASA Aeronautics um, focuses predominantly on the TRL-1 to 4 and stretching into the 5 to 6 range. This is where we can um, we have a better opportunity to advance technology that perhaps has a higher risk of not actually working. It has a higher technology risk, if you will. Industry, um, they have the responsibility of taking technology and, and putting it into product uh, and ensuring that it does in fact work as expected and work safely. So you can see um, they focus largely at the higher TRL levels. Now, of course, in the middle, there's um, mutual interest in the mid-TRL um, range, and I'll speak to that later in the brief. Uh, a couple additional points that I want to make are captured at the bottom of the screen. Um, NASA and the FAA do work um, very closely together. Um, what we do is we help, they help us ensure that the right technical data and the right insights are gained through the course of the research so that that data can help inform their uh, eventual certification and regulatory decisions. And then the last point I want to make is, is that technology infusion takes time. Um, in the end, in, it is industry's job to produce the, um, produce the product inherent with these technologies. And it'll take a business decision on their part, ultimately, to get these into practice. Um, and as you can imagine, you don't just change over the entire airplane fleet at once, as an example. It does take time to infuse the technology uh, into the fleet. So, so where are we with respect to ultra-efficient uh, subsonic transports? Um, this is a, a summary chart that shows four areas of primary interest. This isn't exclusively our entire portfolio, but they are the primary areas of interest around which um, our, our investments is structured at present. And I'll talk to each one of these in, in later charts. Um, the first one being the small gas turbine, uh, small core gas turbine. The second is electrified aircraft propulsion. 
can we bring electric power to bear um, to improve the efficiency of the, the propulsion system? The third one is the transonic uh, truss brace wing. And, and finally, uh, high rate composite manufacturing. So, so taken together, um, these four technologies, we believe, have the opportunity to create what we call a new S-curve. This is a new uh, opportunity, we think, to, to bring, um, bring together a, a new set of, of aircraft systems looking forward. So again, electric aircraft propulsion, what we're doing there is we're looking at where and how electrical power can uh, help augment or complement the propulsive um, efficiency of a gas turbine. Now, this is not flying on all batteries. That's not what we're talking about here, but we're talking about advanced uh, electrical components of other sorts. The, the small gas turbine work um, is, provides an opportunity for improved gas uh, turbine efficiency of these systems. And I'll talk a little bit uh, in a subsequent chart about what the core is and why it's important. You know, the transonic truss brace wing, um, in general, you know, the, the wings could be made much more efficient by being thinner and longer, as you can imagine. But that doesn't uh, introduce some other challenges in terms of these types of configurations. And, and one approach to overcoming those challenges is the inclusion of, of the truss. And you can see that as two diagonal members running underneath uh, each of the wings. And then the, the fourth area, high rate uh, composites. Um, you know, we can manufacture aircraft pretty quickly out of conventional materials, out of, of aluminum, out of metals. Um, we can also manufacture aircraft out of composites. However, um, the rate at which we can manufacture with composites is significantly slower than the rate at which we can manufacture out of metals. So, so the question becomes is what can we do uh, in terms of our advanced technologies and, and perhaps the advanced science around those materials to improve the manufacturing rate. So, so let me start with the um, propulsion related elements first. Um, many folks have not had an opportunity to, to see what's inside of a gas turbine engine. So let me orient you really quickly to some basic terminology. Um, the airflow in this diagram is going from left to right uh, as, as indicated by the yellow arrows. Um, when that air hits the very front of the engine, it is hitting the front of the fan. And the air that is towards the outer part of the fan um, stays towards the outer part. And it, it becomes your bypass flow, as, as indicated by the thick yellow arrow. The, the air that's towards the more center part of the fan um, stays in the core of the engine. And once in the core of the engine, um, that air is further compressed to higher pressures in the low pressure compressor, followed by the high pressure compressor. It is then um, burned with fuel in the combustor and then finally passes through both the high pressure turbine and the low pressure turbine and exits the aircraft. Um, this will be valuable terminology for the next chart. So when we look at um, what technologies, what advancements might be um, um, of value looking forward to these advanced systems, we're, we're focusing on um, the technologies shown here. There's um, technology capability advancements for the um, compressor and those are indicated. Also, um, advancements in the other core components. Now, what I want to point out here is that the advancements that we're going after, whether they're in the, the shape or the materials or the operations of the core, um, are directly related to the efficiency of the engine. In addition, the advancements have to um, achieve certain levels of operability is the terminology we, we use. So, for example, um, oper operability as it relates to the combustor means that the, that combustion process has to be stable and it has to um, be as efficient as possible, resulting in, in as minimal chemical emissions as, as, um, as possible. So the, the next area is the uh, electrolyte aircraft propulsion. And as I said, this is not um, about running a battery uh, exclusively on these vehicles, but it's about, you know, the question is whether we can bring um, advanced electrical components to bear to complement the gas turbine engine in a uh, hybrid sort of way. So, so this, uh, this technology work has its roots, as you see, back in, in 2009, when we first started to, to conceptualize this approach, um, you literally are talking about back of the envelope calculations and some, some very initial uh, layouts of what the system could look like at very low TRL levels, of course. And at that point, we, um, we challenged both industry and academia 
to, to see what they thought these components could be or could do in a system like this. With that knowledge, um, we gained insight into um, what, the, what the motors might have to do, what the inverters might have to do. What was the necessary performance of these components for a system like that? And we gradually, over time, uh, advanced the TRL. We've um, had components built, and we've started to bring them together into to ground tests at, at several um, very specialized facilities here in, in the U.S. And, and we're now at a point where we have to ask ourselves whether there is um, additional knowledge and insight that needs to be gained in flight. So we've recently um, initiated a project called the Electrified Powertrain Flight Demonstration. Um, this project is in early stage planning, looking at what it might take um, to bring a system like this into, um, into a flight environment and really boost the, um, the TRL level. Again, that means demonstrating the technology in a quote unquote relevant environment. So, so the next area I had mentioned was um, high rate composite manufacturing. Um, you know, the, the goal here is um, to bring to bear advanced computational methods, advanced measurement techniques, um, advanced knowledge of these material systems to enable a four to six manufacturing rate increase. Now, now why are composite airframes of of importance? Well, you can improve the efficiency of your aircraft if you can make it lighter. There's a direct relationship there, and and hence the um, the use of very high strength composite materials is very um, very appealing. The the challenge, of course, is is that manufacturing them is very labor intensive and does take a very long time compared to other methods and other material systems. So so the goal is a four to six um, x manufacturing rate increase. Um, with a focus on, on, on the rate, the cost, and the weight of these um, aircraft structures. Um, this is also a, a brand new project area that is in early stage um, planning and formulation. It does, in fact, build off of um, advancements made under a, a recently completed project called the Advanced Composites um, Project. So we'll be taking learning from the Advanced Composites Project and directing that learning into this, this new environment here, focused on composites manufacturing. So let me talk a bit about the transonic truss brace wing, um, similar to, to EAP, as I talked about electrified aircraft propulsion. Um, the roots of this technology go back um, to the 2008-2009 timeframe, which is where you, we um, first identified some of the potential benefits of a, a very long slender wing with the truss supports. Uh, again, at, in the 2008 timeframe, you're literally at TRL1, um, very, very um, uh, high risk, unsure technology at that point. So slowly over time, we've advanced the knowledge, we've advanced the, um, the data that has been gathered and the interpretation thereof of the data over time. So you can see uh, we cite a series of, of wind tunnel tests that have been performed over the years. These are either at different um, flight speeds, simulated flight speeds, or they're at diff slightly different um, configurations of the, the wing and the truss itself. And it, hand in hand with the wind tunnel tests that have been going on, there's been a series, of course, of um, computational fluid mechanics analysis, in other words, um, computer-based simulations of the performance of these um, configurations. Those, those um, computational models, if you will, are, very, are grounded in, in the physics uh, of the possible. And, and so it allows us to, to really learn and compare what we get through the data and what the mathematical computer-based models tell us. Uh, at present, we're getting ready to, to enter um, a phase five of wind tunnel testing. This will include um, a, a buffet test where we look at um, the potential effects of, of the aerodynamic vibrations, and then also um, a, a second look at the high lift characteristics. In other words, how, how might this vehicle perform in under takeoff uh, high lift conditions? And, and to, to try and bring it all together, um, the, the efforts I've been talking about in the previous part of the brief focused largely on, on NASA and industry um, efforts with a, a little bit of engagement from, from universities. But I don't want to leave the universities out of this picture. Um, we have um, complementary to, to our program to advance air vehicles, we have an effort called the University Leadership Initiative. And, and this is an, 
an element of our university strategy that allows um, universities to step forward and, and really be the, the thought leaders um, to taking on challenges associated with those strategic thrusts, including strategic thrust three for the ultra efficient transports. And over the last um, three rounds of solicitation covering the last um, five years or so, we've had uh, the opportunity to work with a lot of um, universities and other university teams, and you see them represented here. Um, and you, you know, the, the academia in this country is extremely talented and we're bringing their talents to bear as well on addressing the, the challenges of aviation in the future. And with that, I'd like to wrap it up and turn it back over to, to Dan. Thank you. Great presentation, Barbara. Thanks so much. Um, really super interesting uh, information. And um, yeah, it, really looking forward to the Q&A. Uh, if you have a question, uh, it's not too late to ask it. There are two ways you can do it. One is by following us on Twitter at ESI Online. You can also send us an email uh, at e or ESI at EESI.org. Uh, and now it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Jeff Overton. Um, Jeff is a fellow with the ESI. Uh, he is a former, uh, a retired pilot, um, a commercial pilot uh, for US Air, and he has been with the ESI for a number of years. He is the author of our stratospherically popular uh, aviation fact sheet that I mentioned from last year, uh, and he has put a ton of work into today. And so it's my pleasure to turn over the Q&A session to him. Take it away, Jeff. Well, thank you, Dan, and thank you both uh, Chris and Barbara for those excellent uh, presentations. We certainly appreciate your spending time with the, with us uh, today, and we learned a lot already from uh, what you've presented. Chris, if I could start with you, um, I wondered if you could share with us uh, what are the key things uh, you think policymakers uh, need to know and act on. Uh, to support SAF and and what do you think are the important policy actions that would expand well the production and use of uh, this strategy this technology uh, thank you Jeff that's a that's a very very good question and uh, certainly um, uh, as um, as uh, congresswoman Brownlee suggested you know she's introduced a bill on sustainable aviation fuel and this is going to help with the, the overall policies. Uh, if we can have, uh, you know, one thing that, that helps is a, a good long-term stable policy uh, initiatives that, that we have across the board. And so right now, uh, out in California, for instance, there is the low carbon fuel standard program. And with that, that has given a lot of incentives to, um, to, the, to the market. Uh, and certainly signals a lot of things to the market and to to the, the producers that are out there. And so that is that is very helpful. The renewable fuel standard that we have uh, that, that's in place also uh, nationally is uh, is very good uh, and it's very broad. But if we can have a national uh, low carbon fuel standard policy, that would be uh, that would be very, very nice. Um, Right now, with, with that low carbon fuel standard um, out in California, there is also a little bit, uh, a little bit more of an advantage uh, for the renewable diesel uh, producers as opposed to the renewable jet fuel producers. They get a little bit more money. And so the, the producers that are out there making re these renewable fuels actually uh, can make a little bit more money um, if they're, they're selling their diesel as opposed to uh, renewable jet fuel. So with that in mind, if they, if they could somewhat uh, incentivize and make it a, a level playing field across the board between renewable diesel and renewable jet fuel, that would certainly help out uh, a lot too. So yes, long-term stable policies. And, um, and so I'm very happy that uh, Congresswoman Brownlee has, has actually done that uh, and, and made things hopefully be able to move forward. Thank you, Chris. And uh, Barbara, if I could uh, turn to you now and uh, ask a question. The uh, industry has set a long-term goal of 50% reduction of CO2 emissions relative to uh, 2005 levels by 2050. And uh, so can you share with us, does NASA set goals for a specific level of efficiency improvement uh, of available technology 
for the fleet uh, over time? Can you discuss that? So, so yes, we do. Um, we do set goals for ourselves. Um, certainly, we are looking to set goals at an aircraft level. Um, so this is aircraft performance level, not at the fleet level, Jeff. Now, those, those goals, um, when, when we set them, they're actually codified. Um, the current version of the goals, which are due to be updated, are currently codified in that strategic implementation plan that um, I provided the, the link to in on my ch second chart. Now, that said, um, th those goals are intended to be stretch goals. They're not um, goals that, are, that translate to regulatory levels. Um, certainly, we work with our colleagues in the FAA so that they understand what stretch goals we're going after, but they're not directly the um, the goals that an FAA, for example, would would regulate to. Um, it, it's it just like any other um, personal endeavor. You really want to stretch, you know, yourself, stretch your capabilities um, as you, as you you know endeavor to make an impact. Thank you, Barbara, and. Uh, so Chris, uh, once again, uh, a question for you. Um, can you talk about policy incentives to promote SAF versus policy mandates uh, for the airlines as SAF customers? And uh, which will be most effective, do you think, in growing the industry uh, now uh, over the next 10 to 15 years? Uh, that's a very good question, Jeff. And um, Yes, I think incentives certainly are are more important and more crucial than uh, than mandates. Um, you know, uh, I, I mentioned to you and, and showed you where uh, Norway and Sweden and others are actually having mandates in place. It's one thing to mandate uh, the use of the of the sustainable aviation fuel, but if you don't, it's okay to put that onto the demand. But if you don't have any supply to actually fill that to fill that demand that is very, very difficult. So you can mandate all day long, but if you don't incentivize the, uh, the actual production and commercialization of the fuel, then that makes it uh, much, much more difficult. So I would say in answer to your question, yes, uh, a policy incentive like a low carbon fuel standard program like we, we talked about earlier, uh, that would be very helpful. Um, a mandate is, uh, is not necessarily that helpful because it's not necessarily making, uh, making people uh, want to do it. We have the demand already out there with all those offtake agreements that I mentioned earlier. So the airlines and general aviation definitely want to use it. It's just right now, um, there's just not as much of a supply. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, and now a question for both of you, if I, if I could. Um, it would seem that uh, you know, with the basket of strategies available to the industry, uh, there's a good deal of commonality or a complementary relationship between technology and sustainable aviation fuels. What are your views on this for, for a question for both of you then, if you could share with us, uh, do they, uh, is there opportunity for you know, us to regard this in, in a complementary way as both strategies working together? Uh, sure, I'll take that first, Barbara, if you don't mind. Um, I think that, yes, we certainly can work together um, as uh, uh, with the sustainable aviation fuel and the fact that it is actually uh, a drop-in replacement. That's a good thing. So it can work on even the advanced um, uh, turbines that, uh, that Barbara was talking about earlier. So that's a, that's a really big key. Um, so yeah, it, it definitely uh, it definitely goes across uh, both the the current uh, the current aviation turbines that are out there, and then the the future as well too. The the cool thing about these uh, these sustainable aviation fuel, and that being that they're a drop in replacement, uh, you know these uh, these airlines that are out there buying uh, buying these planes right now, they're going to be flying those same planes uh, for the next uh, 15, 20, 25 years. And so if we had to say, well, you have to now go out and buy a whole new engine for those planes, it just doesn't make any sense. So having a drop-in replacement in those technologies, I think that's, uh, I think that's really good. Yeah, um, I think Chris, you hit the, hit the mark right on. Um, you know, you're talking about a very um, 
relatively speaking, a near-term opportunity to have impact um, in the sustainable turn of jet fuels. Uh, if you recall, I talked about the advanced um, small core engines. One of the aspects of the operability of the small core combustors is what we call fuel flexibility. How well can these combustors, in fact, operate on alternative fuels, um, including the sustainable alternative fuels? So it's very important uh, to us um, to have that capability baked into the to the longer term technology. Um, as as Chris said, there is you know as a horizon as we look from from the near term um, pieces of the solution to to the um, to the to those that are further out, and and working hand in hand both on the near term and with um, with NASA is is U.S. industry. So the um, U.S. aviation industry is also takes this very seriously, and they work collaboratively with um, both organizations and um, also with the FAA to to make these technologies come into reality and ensure that they do in fact work as uh, desired and are absolutely safe because safety, of course, is paramount to aviation both here and worldwide. Thank you, Barbara. <clears throat> Just about 30 seconds left, uh, so we'll have to make this quick, but I, I did note that you had that excellent slide on the current technologies, what they're working on, and um, it uh, it included a, a hybrid design that, it, that would have uh, conventional propulsion and electrified uh, augmentation. Uh, so that would uh, be an opportunity, I, I think, for to combine the sustainable fuels uh, strategy certainly with uh, with elect uh, with electrification provided by NASA, would it not? Yes, that that's correct, Jeff. So the um, the small core technology is going to be of value whether you're talking a a traditional aircraft propulsion system or you're talking a hybrid electric propulsion system, as you just alluded to. That small core will be instrumental in both cases. Well, thank you both again, and I'll turn it back over to Dan. Thanks. That was a thanks for navigating our Q and A, Jeff. Um, did a great job. Um, ask a quick follow up question about the small core, Chris. You were talking about how uh, SAF is a drop in alternative. Does that hold true for that next generation for the small core engines as well? Will they will they also be able to accept SAFs in the same way? Okay. Okay. Cool. Thanks. I appreciate that. I was just curious. I was thinking about it sort of like the Prius of, 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 uh, of airplanes, a little bit of gas and a little bit of electric. Um, hopefully that's not too far removed from a decent analogy. Um, but the, the, the person who works for NASA is uh, giving me a generous expression, but maybe that's not the right way to think about it. So that's okay. Um, but this was great. This was such an awesome uh, briefing. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you so much, Barbara, for joining us. Um, and to our audience, we know you have options when it comes to climate change education and informational resources. So thank you for choosing to fly with EESI today. Uh, thank you to joining us. Uh, thanks to everyone on Team EESI behind the scenes, uh, Omri, Dan O'Brien, Sidney O'Shaughnessy, Amber Todorov, uh, who was my co-moderator yesterday, and Anna McGinn, who will be my co-roundtable moderator tomorrow, uh, as well as Jeff, of course, and Carol, uh, for all of your contributions uh, to today's briefing. Um, thanks also to our interns, Emma, Joseph, Hamilton, and Karen for helping out, uh, and for Susan, who I think is monitoring the Twitter feed today. So thanks for pitching in as well. It's a great discussion. Tune in tomorrow uh, noon for a roundtable discussion about public transit. Uh, we have representatives from three uh, transportation authorities from around the country joining us. It's going to be a great conversation. Uh, if you have a moment, um, we would really appreciate any feedback you're willing to offer us. Um, we have a slide uh, that will be up in just a moment with uh, a link that you can follow to, um, uh, to fill out that survey. We really take everyone's feedback really seriously and we're always looking for ways to, to improve. Um, and so if you have just two minutes, we'd really appreciate your help with that. Um, and then if you missed anything, if you want to go back and see any of Chris's slides or Barbara's slides, or if you want to revisit something that was discussed during the Q&A, just a reminder, everything is archived online on our website, www.eesi.org. That goes for this briefing, it goes for yesterday's briefing, tomorrow's briefing, as well as all of EESI's briefing over the last uh, many, many years. And while you're there, we hope you take an opportunity to sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. It's one o'clock, we'll go ahead and end it there. Hope everyone has a great rest of your day and hope to see everyone back tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs>